Some of you may remember that tune. That was a tune by Orleans called Dance With Me. And this, uh, this evening I want that to set the tone because uh, as my fingers dance on the strings, I want y'all to enjoy it. I want y'all to just sit back and enjoy the show. If you notice, there's something a little bit unusual about the way I play guitar other than just all the notes you heard. I use this thing called a thumb pick. Now we're most, most accustomed to this thing called a plectrum. That's that little flat pick. But the earliest uh, popular recordings were actually done by a lady way out in Hilton's, Virginia. If you follow Highway 58 completely west, you almost hit uh, Tennessee, you find uh, over on the other side of Interstate 81, way down a winding country uh, road, what's called the Carter Family Fold. And there, a lady named Mabel Carter, uh, she used to use a thumb pick instead of a flat pick that we've grown accustomed to. And she would play just like this. And she played some of the most memorable songs that we've ever heard, and people are still playing them today. Mother Maybell were around, she'd be glad to hear your applause for that. But you notice, uh, played the melody with my thumb, and I strummed with my index finger. Well, out of Muhlenberg, Kentucky, came a fella shortly after that. He decided he was going to do things exactly reverse of that. He was going to strum with his thumb. play with his index finger. It was a 
a fella named Merle Travis. Some of you, I know, oftentimes confuse it with the fella from outside of Charlotte named Randy Travis, but this guy was a completely different kind of fella. Uh, he came from the coal mines of Kentucky, and he brought his style of music to the point where people like Frank Sinatra performed with him. If you've ever seen the movie From Here to Eternity, which was about the uh, preceding days of uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you saw him uh, on stage uh, sitting on the porch uh, playing uh, reenlistment blues. That was Merle Travis. And uh, Merle was always quick to give uh, credit to those who uh, uh, were due. This next song is a uh, credit to the, one of the people who is most influential to Merle Travis, a fellow named Ike Everly. Now, when uh, Merle Travis was telling his son, Tom Bresh, about Ike Everly, he said, now, isn't Ike Everly the father of the famous uh, Everly brothers? Now, y'all have heard of them. You know, a lot of people, f uh, even the Beatles, styled some of their harmonies after the Everly brothers. And Merle was quick to correct his son. He said, well, that's how you young boys say it. He said, uh, fellas my age refer to Phil and Don as the sons of the famous Ike Everly. I think Mr. Price will appreciate that one. <laughs> the song he wrote was one called Guitar Rag. Now, you've been wondering what chicken picking is. Well, chicken picking was based on this song. Kentucky, there's a man mighty lucky by the way, he makes a guitar moan. Keeps him hanging around, singing around a country store. Picking like a chicken, picking up corn. All the gals in the county gather all around him. He's got rhythm in his bones. The feet start scooting and a shuffling drag. When you hear the rhythm of the guitar rag, makes a moan and tone, makes a grumble and groan. He'd make a jackrabbit chase a hound He'd make a deacon put the good book down Oh, the fat and the skinny does a little shimmy And the head start to wiggle and wag The feet start scooting and a shuffling drag When you hear the rhythm of the guitar rag Can put the good book down All the fat and the skinny Does a little shimmy And the head starts to wiggle and wag The feet start scooting And a shuffling drag When they hear the rhythm Of the guitar rag So now you know where it came from Chicken picking chicken, uh, Picking like a chicken Picking up corn But most people don't realize That uh, Merle Travis You know we talk a lot About crossover artists because they cross over from one genre to another. Well, the music of uh, Merle Travis was actually some of the first crossover music there was. He wrote a song that he sang for many years, and uh, it didn't receive a lot of acclaim because uh, uh, while he was an incredible guitarist, he was not a great vocalist. However, there came a guy with a nice, deep, smooth voice named Tennessee Ernie Ford. And all of a sudden, a song that had been done for many years became sold over a million records. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A working man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. Got a mind that's weak and a back that's strong, you load 16 tons. What do you get? You get another day older and deeper in debt. Say, Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. Oh, my soul, 
to the company store I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine I loaded 16 tons a number nine coal And the straw boss said, well bless my soul You load 16 tons, what do you get? You get another day older and deeper in debt Said Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to the company store I was born one morning, it was drizzling rain Fighting and trouble are my middle name Raising a cane break by an old mama line Gain no high tone woman make me walk the line You load 16 tons, what do you get? You get another day older and deeper in debt So Peter don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to the company store So if you see me coming better step aside A lot of men didn't, a lot of men died One fist of iron and the other one of steel if my left one don't get you, then my right one will You load 16 tons, what do you get? You get another day older and deeper in debt So Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to Tennessee Ernie Ford Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. I certainly appreciate that. Shortly after that came a man that people think, well, actually, they don't realize that he is a man. You've heard of the Les Paul guitar before, I'm sure. Uh, Les Paul was a real person. <laughs> he really was. He was along the uh, same period of time as Django Reinhardt, people like that. And uh, if you've ever seen the Les Paul guitar, uh, you, uh, you know why people are so fascinated with it. It is still uh, one of the most popular guitars amongst uh, electric guitarists to this day because of the great sustain, the way it plays. But people don't realize that uh, Les Paul was also the inventor of multi-track recording. In fact, uh, I always tell people no one can play like Les Paul. And the reason is, Les Paul took a reel-to-reel -reel tape player and he would overdub a hundred tracks of him playing the guitar at different speeds. Now how do you duplicate that? <laughs> well what he did is he put a set of controls on his guitar, called it the Les Paul Verizer. And basically all it was were controls to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to a tape player backstage when he would perform. The only problem was the, he could only play the next song that came up. But uh, he was also, uh, like I said, he was also known for, uh, if you're a guitarist, you've heard of phase shifters, uh, all these other different uh, effects that uh, guitarists use to make themselves sound a little better. It was all invented by Les Paul. But what he is most noted for is the solid body electric guitar. But actually, the Les Paul that you see today did not start out looking the way it did. It looked more like this. He was working and he took an Epiphone guitar, took a piece of pine, bolted a neck to it, and went out and uh, uh, tried performing with it. And people made fun of him because he was playing what they called an electric broomstick. <laughs> so he went back and took the wings that he cut off of the, that Epiphone guitar, bolted them on, and then people liked it better. And that was actually the original Les Paul. And it was very similar to this guitar here. This guitar has a solid piece of wood all the way down through the center of it. And uh, the top and all is molded onto it. Uh, but it was interesting. Les Paul, he had a great sense of humor, he had great talent, and his wife, uh, if any can remember Les Paul or Mary Ford, uh, people in the music business uh, tended to travel in the same circles. And uh, his wife, Mary Ford, was actually, her real name was Colleen Summers. She had originally been a backup vocalist for none other than Merle Travis. And so she'd been around music. Now, like I said, not everybody, you can't really play like Les Paul. But he did do a beautiful instrumental called uh, Meet Mr. Callahan. I'm going to try to do that for you tonight.
if you saw Mr. Callahan walking by. Might meet him in the parking lot. Now, the next fellow I wanted to mention to you, now, of course, these are by far not the uh, only people who had uh, a tremendous influence on the way we listen to music today and the instruments that we play. There were other guys like uh, Cowboy Eddie Lang, people like that, that uh, influenced a lot of people tremendously. But there were those that were the uh, had the ability to influence more people. And this next man, uh, while he was a very humble fellow, he influenced probably every guitarist that has ever picked up a guitar uh, since. Uh, and he was not a very impressive person uh, in nature. He, was, uh, he grew up in Latrell, Tennessee. Uh, I remember he played a fiddle sometimes on stage, and he said he came from a, the poor part of Appalachia, and it was just, uh, just natural that he would turn to a life of petty crime and fiddling. He had a good sense of humor about himself. But uh, he developed a style where the bass was very strong, stood out. And uh, being a shy person, uh, he and that guitar were the best friends he had. And so everywhere he went, uh, he played uh, that guitar. And he said when he first started out playing like this, he sounded like two bad guitarists. But uh, he became uh, well known. He was a famous music uh, producer for RCA, uh, the fellow who uh, uh, discovered Elvis. Uh, he replaced him. But the story is always interesting uh, how Merle Travis explains the, this, the discovery of this man. His name was Chet Atkins. Now, many of you have heard about Chet Atkins. Um, in fact, uh, the guitar I'm holding is a Chet Atkins country gentleman. It's no longer in production anymore. Uh, when Chet died, they, uh, so did his style. His way of playing died out too, unfortunately. So that's why I'm so happy to be able to bring this to you today. But Steve Scholl from RCA Records heard that uh, Chet Atkins was out in Denver at a radio station. His brother Jim Atkins was the uh, uh, music uh, uh, program director out there. And Steve Show, uh, who was working for RCA, they were looking for someone who could, pe who could compete with Merle Travis because Merle Travis was uh, making records for uh, Capitol Records and selling a bunch of them. And, and in fact, we think that videos are a new thing, relatively speaking, since the 80s. Well, in California, you know uh, how you see in the old 50s movies where people would sit down at the diner, they put in their, mo their money, and uh, they would hear music right there at their own table? Well, in California, you put in your money and a film strip rolls and you get to see your entertainer playing. Yeah, Capitol Records was way ahead of their time. That was way back then. And so Merle Travis was on a lot of those, uh, those videotapes, so RCA had to find a way to compete with them. Chet Atkins, who had released a song called Can't Heat, was their answer. And so they went out there and they said, Chet Atkins... You're the man we've been looking for. He said, uh, you got a lick that's uh, li kind of like Merle Travis. He said, actually, you play a lot better. He said, but we got to ask you one question. Do you sing? No. <laughs> you don't sing a bit. No, one thing I can't do is sing. I mean, can't you sing just a little? He said, I can't sing a lick. He said, well, that was a shame. We were looking for someone who could play guitar and sing like Merle Travis. Oh, well, I'm saying that good. <laughs> that explains my singing, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> but let me, uh, let me let you listen to one of uh, his more famous uh, instrumentals. Uh, he became very well known for taking... Uh, taking uh, popular songs of the day, turning them into instrumentals, and you could hear the words. He was very talented, uh, almost like an interpreter, translating from one language to another. And this is one of his more famous ones. <laughs>
of you have heard that, Mr. Sandman. But one of the reasons we know who he is today is because of a fellow named John D. Loudermilk from Winston-Salem. Chet almost became one of the greatest jazz guitarists we never heard of. He was absolutely incredible. His hands were fast. He was accurate. And he would practice to death. But he was getting so deep into jazz. Uh, jazz is a beautiful form of music. However, even to this day, there are very few people who can bring jazz to the masses. And so to bring Chet Atkins back to where people could appreciate his talent, John D. Loudermilk wrote an interesting uh, instrumental. Uh, but it was interesting. Uh, Chet spent a lot of time with John D. Loudermilk. In fact, they were uh, uh, on a cruise one time. And uh, they were out on the deck playing their guitars, you know, having a good time. And a crowd gathered around them. They were listening to them play. And as the sun started going down, it came time to hit the buffet. I understand they have those things on cruises. Uh, they went out to the buffet, and uh, man stopped Chet Atkins. He said, Mister, you're pretty good, but you ain't no Chet Atkins. <laughs> but the song that he wrote was one called Windy and Warm. so far. Is it worth coming out tonight? <laughs> uh, I know there are some people who are out there uh, that it's good to see, just good to see, to see me sweat. Uh, but you know, Jerry Reed made a point one time. He said, you know, uh, uh, there, I know there are several of you who are out there to see mistakes. And as Jerry Reed put it, he said, so I have rehearsed several into these pieces of music. But Jerry Reed was a huge influence on Chet as well. In fact, uh, Chet always said, you know, if it wasn't for people like Jerry Reed, uh, uh, some of these people you can look up on YouTube. Lenny Bro, uh, you may have seen at the end of uh, Dance With Me, I did this. Those artificial harmonics. Lenny Bro was a wizard at those things. He could cascade them across to where it sounded just like a har harp. So, you know, take a look at some of these guys. They are fantastic musicians. But uh, Jerry Reed wrote a lot of uh, instrumentals for Chet, and uh, they would perform from time to time on stage. 
And Chet would always say, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Ree is very artistic. You know, his mind's always moving to the next great song. That's why I always had performed these things, because he forgets how to perform his own music. <laughs> and so, uh, but one of the more uh, well-known uh, instrumentals that Chet did that was written by Jerry Reed was one called Winter Walking, and that seems to be appropriate for today. Chet was always one to also remember uh, people like Maybell Carter. And in fact, uh, as you read, probably if you read in the uh, newspaper, uh, I'm from the foothills of Virginia, and I've been here since 86, so I've been adopted into the community. Um, but Chet was always uh, quick to tell people where things start. And the first song I played for you, Wildwood Flower is a song that he learned how to play several different ways but it's such a lovely tune and I'm going to attempt to uh, render it for you the way Chet did it Thank you. 
If you ever find a body and you can't figure out who it is, check the left pocket. If it's a thumb pick, it's me. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that same rhythm uh, got to be quite popular with uh, rockabilly. You ever heard that before? How about this part? Yeah, everybody knows that as Johnny Cash. But what, most people, uh, years ago when they built the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Johnny Cash was inducted into it, a lot of people wondered. But you know, they forgot that Johnny Cash, along with a man named, uh, people knew as Daddy Cat, Carl Perkins, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and of course Elvis Aaron Presley. <laughs> Those were the founders of rock and roll, rockabilly, rock and roll, and much of their music included that very style there. Um, some, somebody uh, pulled my notes too far away for me to see. I wonder why I wore these glasses. But it was interesting, Luther Perkins, who was uh, Carl Perkins' brother, that's all he did. <laughs> Uh, between that, Johnny Cash beating on a big old Martin uh, guitar, and a bass player, Johnny Cash of the Tennessee Two. They caught the world by storm with just that simple style. Just a very simple style, just a little bit of uh, a musical background, and of course, you know, every now and then Luther would get fancy. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Well, we can't do that song tonight because, unfortunately, some of the lyrics, uh, we're having trouble with people taking them seriously, so we, we can't do that. But, you know, one of the songs that really does reflect the spirit of uh, Johnny Cash, the music he played, uh, is One Get Rhythm. And uh, it was featured in the movie Walk the Line. That was a very good song. But it's a, it's a fantastic song that explains just why Johnny Cash, even in his older in his later years, you know, Capitol Records got rid of him after so many years because he wasn't making them any money. So he took his music to American Recordings, and uh, what's it? Oh, you want a little higher? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so he took it to American Recordings, and most of you will remember that he did a song just before he died called Hurt. Yeah, it was actually written by a group called Nine Inch Nails. And so even in his 70s, Johnny Cash proved himself to still be a fantastic artist, a fantastic musical artist. But I'd like to go ahead and do that song, uh, Get Rhythm, for you right now. Get rhythm When you get the blues Come on, get rhythm When you get the blues Rock and roll feeling in your bones Get taps on your toes and get gone Get rhythm When you get the blues Little shoe shine boy never gets so down He's got the dirtiest job in town Bending low over people's feet On a windy corner of a dirty street When I asked him as he shine my shoes How'd he keep from getting the blues? Grinned at me, raised a little head Pop shoe shine rag and then he said Get rhythm When you get the blues Come on, get rhythm when you get the blues It only costs a dime, just a nickel a shoe Do a million dollars worth of good for you Get rhythm When you get the blues Well, I 
I sat down and listened to the shoe shine boy And I thought I was gonna jump for joy Slapped on the shoe paws left and right Grabbed shoe shine rag and he held it tight He raised up the white sweater away Said you my little boy to be working that way Said I like it with a great big grin Popped shoe shine rag then he said it again Get rhythm When you get the blues Come on get rhythm when you get the blues Jumpy rhythm make you feel so fine Shake all trouble from your worried mind Get rhythm When you get the blues So, Johnny Cash made his name and of course he married into the Carter family, he married June Carter Cash and the song Ring of Fire was actually written by June Carter prior to their marriage and uh, he later did a, a song uh, with uh, Mother Maybell and uh, it was advice to, uh, <laughs> to her son uh, that when he did get out there in the world and start, uh, started trying to make a name for himself in music, uh, to always pick the wildwood flower. And Mother Maybell was in the background of that recording and showed her picking the wildwood flower. But uh, Johnny Cash was also a fantastic storyteller. Uh, and I'm going to attempt one of his more difficult stories to tell. Now, a boy named Sue is easy. Everybody's heard that. In fact, Johnny Cash cheated on that one when he recorded it. He recorded that live at San Quentin. And if you ever get a chance to see the video recording of him performing it, he's got the notes right on the side of his guitar and he's reading it. You think I can do that on this guitar? Doesn't look promising, does it? Anyway, uh, so, you know, he could really tell a story, and he, he was very, uh, just so nonchalant about it, just very straightforward. But this is one about him leaving Kentucky and getting a job in Detroit, building cars. Well, left Kentucky back in 49, went to Detroit working on the assembly line. First year they had me putting wheels on Cadillacs. Every day I watched them beauties roll by and sometimes I'd hang my head and cry cause I always wanted me one that was long and black. So one day I devised myself a plan that should be the envy of most any man. I'd carry it out in a lunchbox in my hand. Now getting caught meant getting fired, but I figured have it all by the time I retired. I'd have me a car worth at least a hundred grand. I get it one piece at a time, and it won't cost me a dime. You know it's me when I come through your town. Gonna ride around in style, gonna drive everybody wild. Cause I have the only one there is around. So the very next day when I punched in with my big lunchbox and to help my friends, I left that day with a lunchbox full of gears. I never considered myself a thief, but GM would not miss just one little piece, especially if I strung it out over several years. Well, first day I got me a fuel pump, and then I got me an engine and a trunk, then I got me a transmission and all the chrome. The little things I could get in my big lunch box like nuts and bolts and all four shocks and the big stuff we slipped out my buddy's mobile home. Well up to now my plan went all right till we tried to put it all together one night and that's when we discovered that something was definitely wrong. The engine was a 73 and the transmission turned out to be a 53 and when we tried to put in the bolts all the holes was gone. So we drilled it out so that it would fit and with a little bit of help from an adapter kit Had that engine running just like a song Well the headlights were another sight Had two on the left and one on the right But when we pulled out the switch You know all three of them come on And the back end looked kind of funny too But we put it together and when we got through Well you know that's when we discovered that we only had one tail fin well, about that time, my wife come out, and I could see in her eyes that she had her doubts. She looked at me and said, honey, take me for a spin. She's sitting right over there. So I took her uptown to get the tags, and I headed her right on down Main Drag, and I could see everybody laughing for blocks around. 
<laughs> but you know, up there at the courthouse, they didn't laugh because they type it up. It took the whole staff. And when they got through, the title weighed 60 pounds. I got it one piece at a time, and it didn't cost me a dime. You know it's me when I come through your town. I'm going to ride around in style, going to drive everybody wild, because I have the only one there is around. Uh, yes. Uh, this is the Cottonmouth in the Psycho Billy Cadillac. Come on. Uh, negatory on the price of this machine here. Uh, you might say it just went up to the factory and picked it up. It's cheaper that way. W what model is it? <laughs> it's a 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59 automobile. It's a 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70 automobile. <laughs> you think after that I ought to be done. But that's not the end of our story tonight. Let me swap out for another guitar. This is Jackson Lassiter. He's agreed to do this for nothing. So we're going to let him. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, shortly after that, uh, uh, Vietnam War came along, Korean War, and people were looking for ways to raise social consciousness about uh, what things that they didn't like. And while music had been a great uh, source of entertainment, people discovered it could also be a great way to get people's attention. And so they adopted the adapted the guitar. Got it? Strap yeah, it needs strap on too. Yep. He'll fall out right on my lap. Uh, but they discovered uh, that they could take the style that Merle Travis played. They couldn't play exactly like Merle Travis, but they could take the style and develop a kind of hybrid way of picking it. If you've ever heard dust in the wind, I'm sure most of you have heard that sometime. That's, a, that's basically a hybrid style of uh, the uh, uh, Travis pick. And they used it for a lot of very uh, popular uh, folk songs uh, later on. Uh, people like the Weavers with Pete Seeger playing the banjo, they used it. Do it right, I'll send you back to Arkansas. <laughs> tell your ma, tell your pa. Yeah, yeah. Now, Mr. Price knows that one. <laughs> That's old Ray Charles tune. Uh, and uh, so they decided uh, that they would try to get people's attention. There were people like uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. A little lighter than that. And uh, people started listening to some of the things they had to say. But uh, I'm not going to try to make any political statement myself because we're here to be entertained. But one of the more uh, beautiful songs. It, it, people can corrupt almost anything. They tried to accuse it of being something that it wasn't. But uh, it turned out to be a favorite uh, amongst children. But those children grew up and they turned out, turned into be y'all. And uh, I think you're going to like this. Puff 
the magic dragon lived by the sea frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Honolulu. little jackie paper loved that rascal puff bought him springs and sealing wax and other fancy stuff Together they would travel on a boat with billowed sails. Jackie kept a lookout perched on Puff's gigantic tail. Noble kings and princes would bow whene'er they came. Pirate ships would lower their flags when Puff roared out his name. Oh, Puff the magic dragon lived by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Legend, dragons live forever, but not so little boys. Painted wings and giant springs make way for other toys. One gray night it happened, Jackie Paper came no more. And Puff, that mighty dragon, he ceased his fearless roar. His head was bent in sorrow, spring scales fell like rain. Puff no longer went to play along the cherry lane. Without his lifelong friend, Puff could not be brave. So Puff, that mighty dragon, sadly slipped into his cave. The magic dragon lived by the sea, frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Honolulu. Oh, Puff, the magic dragon lived by the sea, and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Honolulu. So you do remember it. I apologize, this guitar has a... The battery comes on for the pickup through this cord here, and it makes a racket. But it will keep you awake. Um, most people don't think about uh, the Beatles and Chet Atkins together. But uh, the British invasion... I don't know, I'm sure uh, over the years people have seen uh, uh, the famous concert, the Beatles' first concert at Shea Stadium. Uh, George Harrison was a huge fan of the Beatles. I mean, George Harrison was a huge fan of uh, Chet Atkins, and if any picture that you ever see of the Beatles, you'll find uh, George Harrison playing a, a Gretsch version of that guitar back there. He had always he always carried a, a, a Chet Atkins signature edition of it. But it also affected some of their music. In fact, uh, because they were musicians, uh, uh, they were invited to arts openings. That's, uh, that's how y'all got to know me, was because of uh, me playing guitar. Uh, Miss Kara there decided she uh, would like to have a little music at our art openings here in Clinton. Well, Paul McCartney was sitting there, and he, he really couldn't play like Chet. He's a bass player, you know, and he could strum guitar. He's left-handed. But he's doing this little... That's what he was trying to do, something like that. But it turns out, it turned out to be a song that turned out to be quite popular. Let me try that again, see if you recognize it. Mr. 
show. Some of the first music I learned how to play was stuff by the Beatles like that. I always loved uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. I couldn't play the way I do now, but I could do uh, a little song they called Bookends. It was attached on to a song called Old Friends. I was looking at some of the uh, Beatles memorabilia I came across a song I didn't recall uh, ever hearing them play and I looked it up on the internet and I found some uh, conflicting ideas as to who, who actually did it it was a song called Streets of uh, London uh, you can't imagine the Beatles doing uh, such a uh, intense folk uh, period song but they did and uh, a fellow named Ralph McTell he claims uh, uh, ownership to the song if you look on the internet but you also find a copyrighted version by the Beatles and so I want to try to do that for you the first time I heard it was a fella from uh, just outside of Reedsville North Carolina he did it uh, a fella named Tony Rice perhaps you've uh, you've heard some of you have heard of Tony Rice he knows how to make a flat pick sound like your finger picking the guy is very talented scares me so uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to try to do that for you. It's called Streets of London. Have you seen the old man who walks the streets of London? In the car. Let me try that one more time. Have you seen the old man in the worn down markets? I forgot it again. Kicking up the papers in his worn out shoes. In his eyes you see no pride. They're loosely at his side. Yesterday's papers telling yesterday's news. So how can you tell me that you're mourning? Before you the sun won't shine. Let me take you by the hand, lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. And have you seen the old gal who walks the streets of London? 
dirt in her hair and her clothes in rags she's no time for talking she just keeps right on walking carrying her home and to carry her bags so how can you tell me that you're mourning say for you the sun won't shine let me take you by the hand Lead you through the streets of London I'll Show you something to make you change your mind And in an all-night cafe at a quarter past eleven Same old man sitting there on his own And in a in Looking at the world over the rim of his teacup And each tea lasts an hour and he wanders home alone So how can you tell me that you're mourning Say for you the sun won't shine let me take you by the hand Lead you through the streets of London I'll show you something To make you change your mind Have you seen the old men outside the seaman's mission? Memories fading with the metal ribbons that they wear. And in the winter city, the rain cries a little pity for one more forgotten hero in a world that doesn't care. So how can you tell me that you're mourning? Say for you the sun won't shine Let me take you by the hand Lead you through the streets of London I'll show you something To make you change your mind I'm gonna change guitars Now, some some people raised us some issue about uh, songs not being written the way they used to be. You know, there was a there was a famous man who said he would always rather write a standard than he would a hit. You know what the difference between a standard and a hit is? Well, what you've been hearing tonight are standards, and many of them were written over 50 years ago. Do you think they're still good songs, regardless of how they were performed? <laughs> Yeah, they're still beautiful songs. Those are standards. Those are songs that uh, you'll be thinking about. Uh, you'll be walking around the house singing for years to come. Uh, but there's nothing that's being written nowadays uh, that has that instrumental quality or the musical sound to it, the lyrical sounds that we hear now. Uh, they're not the... Uh, can, you pick one, can you pick one song that you would think would make a good instrumental nowadays? Kind of hard to pick, isn't it? Yeah. So we're not writing standards. We're not writing standards anymore. And so uh, I've uh, I've heard people say, well, that music that you play is so old. Well, yeah. But, you know, it's still going to be here for a long time. And uh, thanks to you folks listening to it, uh, uh, you all will carry it on for a long time to come as well. But what I want to do is I want to do some, some songs that are standards. But you have to consider the people who wrote them, too. Now, this first song, if I could only figure out how to get this thing on me, too. You know, I mentioned Pete Seeger and the Weavers. Uh, they were a group from way back in the 40s. Uh, you know, back during the time of... Uh, 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 what was his name? Um, 
or uh, uh, Woody Guthrie. You remember This Land is Your Land? That was written by a fellow named Woody Guthrie. And uh, Pete Seeger was, uh, here's some hum. Okay. All right, anyway. So Pete Seeger was, uh, w he had a maid named uh, Elizabeth Cotton. Now, Elizabeth Cotton was from uh, Chapel Hill. But uh, she was an elderly black lady who played the guitar left hand. She'd take this guitar, turn it upside down the other way, and she would play the guitar uh, uh, the way she liked it. But she did an instrumental, some words to it. And when Pete Seeger said, heard her do that song, he said, Elizabeth, you're not going to be my mate anymore. He took her on the road with her, and she started playing her song and touring with him. And I'm going to do this song for a fellow we have in the audience named Cross Tie. Ah, uh oh. Well, we know he can get blood to his face. <laughs> it was a song called Freight Train. coming out cross style <laughs> another song that was written came from right here in North Carolina or rather the man did uh, a fellow named Don Gibson uh, I believe he was from Rocky Mountain North Carolina if you ever felt real lonesome at home all by yourself especially in flu season nobody wants to be around you well, you can understand the, uh, the, the reasoning behind his words. A song called Old Lonesome Me.
Well, folks, the clock is is at eight o'clock. We said from six to eight. Can I do just one more? One more? Just one more. Okay. somebody joke about singing an instrumental well I'm getting ready to do that that tune is called yakety axe or yakety sax depending on how far back you go well Merle Travis is very good at writing uh, uh, lyrics to instrumentals Jed Atkins took that instrumental on a guitar all the way to number five in 1965 on the pop charts and about ten years before he died Merle Travis wrote a lyric to it I'm gonna put it on you now Stand back. Here it comes. Poverty stricken, still I'm sticking to the things I know to be facts. One day it's feathers, next day a chicken while I'm picking my yakety yaks. Everybody says I never will get far keeping out of work by picking this guitar, lifting on shoestring, putting off things like a shave and a haircut. I told you stand back. Money don't matter as long as I scatter a little bit of happiness around. If people keep grinning, I figure I'm winning with my good old yakety sound. City folks going around turning up the noses, counting their greenbacks, smell, smelling their roses. I wouldn't trade my yakety axe even for a T bone. Now I'm confessing I never took a lesson. All my notes are a matter of guessing. Hoping they'll come out in some kind of manner that'll make a yakety sound. So if you're in the mood and your feet start tapping, you feel laid back and your hands start clapping, then I've done what I want to from way back. You're digging my yakety axe. Shave and a haircut, two bits. <laughs> Ain't nobody coming up here to relieve me. Okay, I got one more. Now, it's uh, I had I had a fellow here in town tell me I had a self-playing guitar. I wish that was so because I wouldn't have made all the mistakes I did. So what I'm going to do, this is an instrumental I wrote several years ago. It's based, uh, it's based on a beautiful old uh, folk tune, country song, bluegrass, however you want to render it. It's called uh, Home Sweet Home. Second home. Are we getting there? Yeah. I don't know. Took it in one of them, hanging on my neck. Like a lot of you, I haven't had supper yet, so I'm going to put on a feed bag when I get home, too.
Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you very much.